Hey there, today we're gonna take a look at some patterns or sequences that you can use in jazz improv. Somebody with the YouTube name Pretzel722 asked me about if I could uh, cover, uh, do a lesson on this topic. So here goes. Many people have this idea that they, they're afraid to use patterns or practice patterns because it sounds boring when you're playing it. You often hear people say things like, uh, I don't like this or that player because he or she plays too many patterns, uh, as if that would make a musician great or not. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I have my own ideas about it. And what I'm going to try to explain in this video is that you, when, when I work on patterns or sequences, um, and I'll explain what that is in a second. I use it as a technique exercise rather than an improvisational tool, but you can use it as an improvisational tool as well, meaning that pr uh, play them in a more creative and interesting way. But first we need to work on them technically so that we can play them uh, on our instrument. So. I'll give you some patterns that I like, and uh, we don't want too complicated uh, pat patterns that are too complicated. You could obviously make them very intricate and uh, difficult. No, we want to keep it simple. So what I used to do, I used to have this book, uh, the Peter Sprague technique book. I don't think it's in print anymore, but it has a whole bunch of patterns in it that I used to practice. Uh, and going through the different scales, major and melodic minor and all those modes. Uh, that was when I practiced a lot. So I would play through all the keys and all those scales and all the patterns and then maybe spend a couple of minutes on each. Uh, yeah, I should also mention that some people refer to this kind of exercise as a Hannon type uh, exercise. And that's all coming from this piano method book by this composer named Hannon, I think, where there's a whole bunch of exercises like that. Uh, the idea is that it's not music, right? It's kind of like you're preparing for what's coming next when you're playing music. So let's say you worked on those exercises a lot. Then when you're about to play Beethoven or Chopin or whatever, you're going to be, that's how I understand it, you're going to be, to be more prepared because you've already gone through all these kind of finger exercises that is required to play advanced music. There is also something called the jazz Hannon with more bebop oriented patterns, I think. There, I think there's a whole bunch of different Hannon type books out there these days. Um, so it's kind of like going to the gym, right? You lift weights if you're a soccer player or football player, if you're in Europe. But when you're playing a game or a match, you're not actually lifting weights, right? But the, the weight lifting prepares you for the demands of an athlete. It's the same thing here. When I'm improvising and I get into an idea, let's, let's, let's say that's an idea. I want to keep going. I want to keep that idea. Anybody can hear that that's some kind of melodic shape that is moving somewhere. Uh, I don't want it, my technique to be in the way, right? I want to be able to go with that idea. Uh, so if I have practiced that kind of stuff, obviously that's going to help me. Uh, but at the end of the day, this should be the, the melodic idea that decides what's happening, not your technique. Um, okay, so let's look at some patterns. 
I want to divide them into a couple of different categories. So intervals, triads, and arpeggios, four note arpeggios, and then you add chromaticism to each one of these. So let's start with intervals, so thirds. <laughs> That's what I would, would imagine would be one of the first Hannon exercises, right? Most of you have probably seen that kind of exercise at some point. So here I'm playing it in a position, vertically, rather than horizontally. So I've made a video in the past on playing vertically versus horizontally and I'll link to it in the description below. So I'm not going to repeat myself here, but you could do, do both. You could play in positions, right? Like Berkeley type positions and then the next and then the next and so on. Or you could try to play them on one string or two strings. Ultimately, I think you want to be able to combine both techniques, depending on the pattern. In this case, it works great for position playing. So there isn't really a fingering issue with thirds. F thirds are fine. Then you play them reversed. So. And here, guitarist Miles Okasaki points out something really important, I think. It's that it's kind of redundant to do that because that's the way I understand him anyway. I, he, I might be uh, reading too much into it, but because if you, if you leave out the first note, those are fourths, right? So. We're gonna get to that when we do fourths. So some of these patterns are redundant. Just something to consider. Uh, so I'm, then you'll do alternating both, up and then down. Still works great in the position, but you wanna be able to play the entire fretboard, right? So either way, if you're more of a vertical player or horizontal, All depends on what kind of player you are, what kind of technique you are have, right? A player like Frank Gambali would probably accommodate his these patterns to his technique, as opposed to somebody who's a let's say a tapper, a, f a fourth finger tapping player. They would obviously have a completely different fingering. So it all depends on on. There are no right and wrong answers there. I think it all depends on what kind of player you are. Um, so this is how I would practice this. So now we're just practicing technique, right? We're not practicing creativity yet. Metronome. So it doesn't have to be super fast because we're not practicing speed really here. We were just practicing learning the fretboard. So I would do it reasonable range, like from here to here maybe. So. sure if I could do it at uh, eighth notes or sixteenth notes or whatever uh, but yeah you want to pick a tempo that is good and you might also want some kind of uh, pedal note so that you depending on how sure how strong your ears are especially when you get into the modes because the modes tend to what happens is we tend to shift so that we if let's say you're playing Dorian so all of a sudden we hear the major, the Ionian instead, because we shift the, the gravity of the key. 
So some kind of pedal. I actually have this really funny uh, Indian drone app. Let me see if I can pull it up here. The Tampura Droid. So you can set a, set a, pet, a, a drone. So here's a C. It actually has the fifth in it, so it wouldn't work for low Korean and those scales. That might seem like kind of a ridiculous thing to do, but I, I kind of think it makes it more fun. And it's, it's easy, you can, you can change the pitch quickly. So the metronome makes you, while well, you're improving your time, but it also will, you will notice where your trouble areas are. So let's say the trouble areas could be a certain area of the fretboard, or maybe a certain uh, fingering issue. You're noticing that your pinky is not, uh, doesn't want to obey you, or it could be that certain key, because you want to go through all the keys. Major modes, melodic minor. That, that's it, I think. That's enough. Then you add chromaticism. So you could, uh, you could uh, approach each third from below. <laughs> Maybe the from above. Or you could do a note and then chromatically go down and come back up. And then third. I should also mention that these patterns you can look at them in different ways which is interesting um, f the first one for example just thirds you can look at that as the first note of a major scale and then the third and then the second note of a major scale D and the third the third note of a major scale E you could look at it as a third going down a second third going down a second third up down a second there are many ways you can see or think of these patterns which is interesting I think yeah you want to do all the intervals right so fourths and fifths and then uh, so, some intervals it's I've talked about that in my previous video on horizontal versus vertical playing. It works much better to play this way than in position. Some of them work good for uh, vertical playing. Other intervals are better. Um, it's better to play them this way. Fifth, for example. I like to play them on two strings like that in the kind of uh, Pat Metheny style, right? All right, so let's move on to triads. So triads in C major. Now here we have what I would consider a fingering issue. When I play that note and I'm, I'm on a G and I'm gonna play the D, you have this rolling thing that I try to avoid, especially with the pinky. Obviously you could do it and some people have no problem doing that. I try to stay away from that. It doesn't work for me. So I would play triads perhaps this way. Right, so... And then I keep going on the next set of strings.
which would make it would give me some uh, awkward fingering. So, uh, some of the fingerings are going to be pretty awkward. I do this crazy position shift there from the E minor to the F major, but it's easier for my brain to do that. So I sacrifice some of the proper fingerings for the, the sake of pragmatic reasons. It's easy. I'm probably going to do that when I'm playing. That's how I like to think about it. I'm probably going to do whatever I think I'm going to pl play, how I'm going to play at the end of the day when I'm performing. That's how I practice. But you could also, of course, do some kind of pivot. I don't know. There are many ways to solve those problems. I like to uh, quote one of my previous teachers back, back in the day, Dan Gilbert, who said, I don't really care about your fingering problems. Solve them. So I think that's a good attitude to have. Um, now, the triads could obviously also be played reverse. Or alternating up and down. This one works better in position. I'm doing a combination of of everything I think uh, let me just tune up real quick here okay now let's add some chromaticism from maybe from below wow. one of my favorite patterns sequences ever is this one when you do it from the top note It's a very Coltrane sounding pattern. He plays that a lot. Another thing that is very interesting or important to consider is that now we have some patterns have two notes, some have three or four or what have you. So we can group, so we can play these uh, groupings with different subdivisions to make it more interesting. So. Those would be uh, four note uh, groupings as yes, quarter notes. Sorry, as sixteenth notes. But if you play them as triplets, or even sixteenth, uh, six tuplets, six tuplets. Uh, uh, that was a bit too fast. Uh, that's something I need to work on. Uh, and it sounds more interesting, right? So you've already made it more interesting just by changing the subdivisions. Because now it's not as uh, static. It's more uh, ambiguous and it's more, it kind of, it, yeah, it's more interesting that way. Uh, so we'll, I'll get back to that later in the video. Uh, where were we? Triads. Yep, uh, then we have uh, four note arpeggios. You do that, want to do this with melodic minor as well, right? So
Okay, and uh, all the keys, right? Entire fretboard, all the patterns, a uh, lot of work. That's why it's important to keep this pretty simple uh, because it's already a lot of work. So you don't want, you maybe want to skip the more complex patterns, right? Sometimes people will show you really complex patterns. And, uh, control so we can place this or something, but it's like, yeah, that's, that's great, but let's do that another day. Uh, also adding chromaticism. That's a great pattern because now we have a five note note grouping. So now let's say you have practiced this in all the keys and melodic minor and all the rest of it. You want to apply this kind of thing to as an improvisational tool and play it over a tune like I did in the beginning there. Uh, notice that I played Beautiful Love, but I completely ignored the changes. I just played uh, D minor. And I picked that tune because it's kind of diatonic. And also another person asked me on YouTube if I could cover that tune as a kind of a key center improvisational approach. So I'm killing two birds with one stone here. Uh, yes, you can play. Think of that tune as everything in D minor, even though some chords stand out and you could or should play other scales there, you can still think just D minor, right? Uh, some of you are thinking, well, shouldn't you be able to play those changes properly? And yes, you should, but it's also good to do this. I think I remember when I learned how to outline chords, outline changes with bebop scales and arpeggios, I remember being kind of stuck in that. And Scott Henderson told me that you know what? You don't have to outline every chord. We, we were playing Falling Grace or a tune like that, and I was really desperate to really play every chord. And he stopped me and said, you know what? It's not, it's great that you can do that, but every now and then you have to kind of just let go and play as it's in one key, right? So there is no, you could do both. So I'll take some of these patterns I showed you and I play them over beautiful love. So, so maybe just the thirds. triplets uh, and then I'll add chromaticism I can play that as six tuplets. Yeah, something to work on, and then uh, some triads. Too fast, and then maybe with uh, the chromaticism. You 
get the idea. So it's another way, what happens here is that you can kind of find out where your limit is. So I noticed that some of these patterns, I couldn't really play them clean at that tempo, at that subdivision. So then there's something for me to work on if I want to improve my technical abilities, right? Uh, so again, here, we're, this is not very musical at all, right? Some of you are probably thinking, oh, that sounds, I don't want to sound like that because it's very, obviously if you play like that, it's too predictable and contrived and, and uh, really boring. But again, we're, we're working on technique now, if you want to play these patterns as an improvisational tool, you can do what I talked about. You could subdivide them differently. So a four note group as six, six tuplets already there, it sounds more interesting. You could also anticipate. So instead of playing, you play start a beat early. So it sounds like this. more interesting uh, you could do them like groups of five you leave a little rest every between each group so right another thing you can do is don't play the same pattern all the time so if you're playing triads maybe throw in a third every now and then you could also jump to a new scale degree all of a sudden Especially you could use rhythms like mixing up different uh, patterns, right? So, uh, for example, the I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to try to mix it up, take a pattern, I'm going to try to mix it up rhythmically. So maybe the thirds with chromaticism. And then jump around. in different intervals. another technique you can play out of time like there's like you don't care what time you just kind of go for it in some kind of uh, obscure subdivision so there's that's more of an uh, more of a uh, creative mindset so but you want to separate those two those are two different practice sessions I think you practice the technique then you make sure that you're doing it properly and you're consistent and your entire fretboard and you figure out where your weak areas are. And then when you're being creative, you want to put on a backing track and try to be experiment, experiment with these ideas and try to expand on it and try to come up with how many different ways. Basically, that's what creativity is, in my opinion, is how many ways can you do something? How many ways can you approach something? So uh, that was that. Then I have uh, a couple of favorite patterns, one that involves uh, bebop scales as well as regular arpeggios, and then I have just my favorite pattern in general, 
and I'll make another video and post it for my patrons. So super thank you to my patrons for if you support me there, you get access to more videos. By the way, this is my new my new place where I'm making videos. So I wasn't sure I've used the paintings or the pictures here in the background. Maybe it's too distracting. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, so hopefully the lighting here is better and uh, all that. So yeah, that was my uh, super long video for this time. I shall see you next time.